Beatty, Dr. Finan. Hi, Jimmy. Hi, Mr. Malfi. <clears throat> Okay, so should I start? Are we are we recording? I think we're ready. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, good evening to all who are watching live tonight and those who will be watching in the future. Welcome to the first of what will be a continuing conversation focusing on diversity and racial sensitivity within the Scranton School District. The SST is a richly diverse multicultural learning community so it is only fitting <clears throat> that a focused discussion on increasing equity and inclusion at all levels be held. Tonight's panelists are all longtime staff members of the district and are passionate about their work and research in these areas. <clears throat> Tonight's emphasis will be on problem solving rather than problem watching or problem commenting. Um, and so without further ado, um, tonight's panelists will introduce themselves and their reasoning for wanting to be a part of tonight's discussion. So whoever wants to start can. If Laura, you'd like to. Yeah, yeah, I can begin. Sure. Um, my name is Laura Sasek. I'm a second grade teacher at Isaac Trip Elementary. In the fall of 2020, I began my 15th year as an educator in the Scranton School District. I'm a graduate of West Scranton High School, and I spent my entire school career in the district. I care deeply about the students and families in this community, and it is because of them that I find this work to be paramount. The implementation of culturally responsive training, as well as setting an anti-bias foundation, are essential to the education of my current students, my former students, and my future students. Thank you. My name is Julie Zaleski. This is my seventh year in the district, and I'm currently teaching fourth grade at Isaac Tripp Elementary. I'm a former student of the Scranton School District and a taxpayer in the city of Scranton. My two children will also be attending the Scranton School District in the near future. I'm honored to be a part of this discussion tonight as I know the importance of respect, acceptance, and belonging for my students and for my own children. Hi, I'm Phil Odom, <clears throat> Scranton School District employee for 20 years. Um, I'm the director of youth enrichment. Um, just want to be able to just contribute any way I can towards diversity and make sure that, um, you know, serving on a, the equity diversity board and, and just trying to make sure that we enrich our, our, our staff as well as our students, you know, with diversity. My name is Robert McLeod. My current position in the district is seventh grade math at Northeast Intermediate. I've been with the Scranton School District for 10 years. This is my 10th year in Scranton. I am a product of the state of New Jersey. I was born in New Jersey uh, some years ago. And um, <laughs> my family relocated to uh, PA, Northeast PA, where I grew up in Wilkes-Barre. Taught in the Wilkes-Barre Area School District for 10 years as an elementary teacher. I always had a, a love for math. So I decided to go back to school to get my middle school math endorsement, which is why I am currently a middle school math teacher. We need this meeting. This meeting is severely overdue. And I've, I've come to the point where as um, I'm overly frustrated with the fact that, you know, this district has such great potential to, to be a pioneer, you know, instead of being reactive to everything like state mandates, federal mandates, what have you, let's get out in front of the ball. Let, let's, let's be an example. Let's be a model for other districts to follow instead of us figuring out what, you know, what the other district is doing. I'm just, I'm just, I'm overly patient. I mean, impatient. I'm just frustrated, and um, I want change. Like five years ago, like I want change five years ago. That that's where I'm at. So this meeting is long overdue, and I'm excited about it. Thank you. This is me. Hi, I'm Holly Mead. I also teach at Northeast in seventh grade English. Um, I've been a teacher for about 24 years. I've been in Scranton for about 13. 
Um, I have a degree in English and I have my master's degree in special ed. Sorry about that. And I also, um, I have, sorry. And um, I also am very interested in diversity. Um, I grew up in California in a very diverse environment. Um, and I've taught in many other big cities such as Pittsburgh, Los Angeles, West Virginia, Boston. Um, I've always been um, in inner city schools and been in diverse places. And I feel that the Scranton School District could use a little bit of work in the diversity category, um, especially training their teachers. Um, I think we can't expect anything to change if we don't train our teachers and train our staff. And that's where I'd like to help. So that's what I'll be talking about later on today. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. So um, Mrs. Sosick and Ms. Zelensky, if you would um, kindly begin your presentation. Sure. Is it okay that I share my screen? Yes, you may. Okay. So before we begin, we would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone um, for having us. Particularly, we'd like to thank Sarah for including us in this important conversation. We'd like to begin by offering a little background regarding the equity committee that was established in the beginning of the 2020-2021 school year. It is comprised of 20 members in various positions across the district. We have subcommittees that were established, including data analysis, human resources, and curriculum. Through a partnership with the Pennsylvania School Board Association, our equity committee is embarking on a years long journey to create and implement a fully comprehensive equity policy. The department, the development of the equity policy is in its beginning phase we are analyzing data that we've gathered via an equity audit, and we're using the results of this data to help us determine five top priority areas, including professional learning, school policy, school organization, staff, and school climate and environment. We're defining terms to be included in our policy. We're developing a deep understanding of equity by attending various professional development sessions, and we're developing a clear mission statement. The mission statement is as follows. We believe equity is the just and fair distribution of resources based upon each individual student's needs. Equitable resources include funding, programs, policies, initiatives, and supports that target each student's unique background and school context to guarantee that all students have equal access to a high quality education. Our purpose is to provide the organizational framework and structure needed to redesign a more equitable school district. This includes, but is not limited to, re-examining policies and eradicating practices that create an imbalance within our school communities and in our workplaces deconstructing biases and creating equitable experiences for every member of our community are the core principles of this mission. While we find our work on the equity committee to be vital, we're most passionate about setting an anti-bias, culturally responsive foundation within our district. For the purpose of being completely transparent, we'd like to take this opportunity to explain these terms as they will be used frequently throughout this presentation and are fundamental in understanding the purpose and mission of this work. Anti-bias education is an approach to teaching and learning designed to increase understanding of differences and their value to a respectful and civil society and to actively challenge bias stereotyping, and all forms of discrimination in schools and communities. It incorporates inclusive curriculum that reflects diverse experiences and perspectives, instructional methods that advance all students' learning, and strategies to create and sustain safe, inclusive, and respectful learning communities. Cultural responsiveness requires individuals to be culturally competent. This competency is having an awareness of one's own cultural identity and views about differences and the ability to learn and build on the varying cultural and community norms of students and their families. Social justice is justice in terms of the distribution of wealth, 
opportunities and privileges within a society. This speaks directly to equity. The first step in achieving this is with district-wide diversity training. Diversity training is any program designed to facilitate positive intergroup interaction, reduce prejudice and discrimination, and generally teach individuals who are different from one another how to work together effectively. Individuals who are different from one another include, but are not limited to, these types of diversity. In the identity domain, we're referring to demographic differences that are often but not always visible, such as gender, sexuality, race, nationality, age, and size. In the cognitive, not cognitive domain, we're referring to how we think about the world, the tools, resources, knowledge, and models we have, such as education and training, risk tolerance, hobbies and interests, intro and extroversion, work and life experience, values and bias. In the neural domain, we're referring to the neurological variation, that part of natural and quote, normal genetics, such as the autism spectrum, depression, ADD and ADHD, anxiety, dyslexia, and addiction. 50%, 54% of the Scranton School District population is non-white. In addition to that, over 2,200 students have IEPs in place, according to data collected by the National Center for Education Statistics. So knowing our district's diverse makeup, we set out to find some research on the positive impact of adopting culturally responsive training programs, and we found the following. A group of researchers from Sam Houston State in Houston, Texas, noted in their work on school-wide cultural competence and leadership preparation, a growing body of research that documents how culturally responsive educational leadership positively influences academic achievement and students' engagement within the school environment. Professors Muhammad Khalifa, Mark Gooden, and James Earl Davis observed that culturally responsive leaders need to continuously support minoritized students through an examination of their assumptions about race and culture. Further, they argue that as demographics continue to shift, so should leadership practices that respond to student needs. Understanding that it's deleterious for students to have their cultural identi identities rejected in schools and unacknowledged as integral to student learning. Julie and I believe that not providing students with inclusive curriculum materials, specifically textbooks and readers, without representation of their own lives and identities is doing just that. When we don't prioritize this, we are essentially ignoring who our learners really are and where they come from. Using our unique platform and knowing we had to start somewhere, we began looking at resources suggested by the Pennsylvania Department of Education. As quoted by Pedro A. Rivera, Secretary of Education, he stated, the Pennsylvania Department of Education, PDE, is committed to helping schools across the Commonwealth meet our shared goals of ensuring that every learner has the access to a world-class education system that helps prepare them for success in the classroom and beyond. Critical to that mission is creating a culture of inclusiveness at all schools across the Commonwealth where students feel safe, respected, and welcomed. In PDE's Equity and Inclusion Toolkit, we discovered Learning for Justice. Learning for Justice is an all-encompassed program for educators and students. It provides free resources to educators, teachers, administrators, counselors, and other practitioners who work with children from kindergarten through high school. Educators use these material, materials to supplement the curriculum, to inform their practices, and to create inclusive school communities where children and youth are respected, valued, and welcomed participants. Within Learning for Justice, they offer free professional development resources, including workshops, trainings, facilitator guides, self-guided learning, webinars, podcasts, and magazine subscriptions. They also have an endless amount of classroom resources that are free. 
Laura and I have had the opportunity to implement these into our classrooms and would be happy to present a more comprehensive look at them if anyone was interested in learning more. But in respect of everyone's time this evening, our main focus will be on professional development. We know it's important to have input in professional development that we're receiving according to our ATSI plan. An ATSI plan is designated by the Pennsylvania Department of Education every three years when one or more student groups in a school perform below the thresholds for academic proficiency, academic growth, and at least one additional factor or indicator. Designated buildings then create an individualized ATSI plan. At Isaac Trip Elementary, our ATSI plan presents data-supported challenges, which include improving school culture and professional development. One of our outcomes to promote and sustain a positive school culture, the way to satisfy that outcome would be through learning for justice by providing a culturally responsive approach with standards and materials that educators can use in their classroom. Another outcome is to identify professional learning needs through an analysis of data, in addition to educators providing input on professional development. A way to satisfy this is through Learning for Justice by its offer of professional development workshops, webinars, podcasts, facilitator guides, and self-guided learning materials. Along with our ATSI plan, the data we collected through our district-wide equity audit supports the need for this professional development as well. I was having trouble unmuting, I'm sorry. The professional development options um, offered by uh, learning for Justice are as follows. There are webinars, workshops, and trainings. So first, let's take a look at the webinars. The webinars offered are available on demand. There are 60 minutes in length, there's no viewer limit, and the webinar resources are all included. We feel like these might be perfect for our shorter in-services. We would suggest starting with a web series called Equity Matters. It's a four-part series, including developing empathy, engaging families, confronting implicit bias, and understanding equity literacy. There's also a great option for number two. It's called the School Climate Webinar. That has three parts, and it's um, responding to hate and bias at school. Let's Talk, facilitating critical conversations with students, and speak up at school. We also, um, although Learning for Justice is not a credit-seeking agency, we did find out that administration can determine if participation will count toward continuing education requirements. Although the webinars offer helpful guidance and great ideas from experienced teaching and learning specialists, we would really love the opportunity to register for workshops and trainings. Learning for Justice has a dedicated team of professional development trainers who provide interactive social justice workshops to educators. However, workshops and trainings are full for the remainder of 2021. When we first started looking at social for justice at, or learning for justice in May of 2020, slots for trainings in the fall of 2021 were rapidly filling. Our district should secure a spot for 2022 as soon as the dates are announced. Laura and I received a newsletter. We receive them weekly from Learning for Justice and are anxiously awaiting the updated 2022 calendar. Well, considering Learning for Justice is filled until 2022 and because this professional development is so pivotal, we had to look into other options. Learning for Justice suggested a list of outsourced educational consultants who provide similar professional development. We have been in communication with Jamila Pitts and are in the process of confirming professional development for the beginning of next, of next school year. Ms. Pitts is an educator, author, speaker, and advocate known for culturally responsive educational teaching and consulting. As a part of our plan, 
three educators from each building will be trained and become the point person for their building. Those educators will then disseminate the information to their respective faculties and continue to meet with Ms. Pitts for coaching sessions throughout the year, bringing with us challenges that arise and finding solutions as a team. Now this training will be paid in full with the funds that we raise. With the help of district educators, community members, and anonymous donors, we use don donorschoose.org to raise $500 for culturally responsive and anti-bias training for educators. It took about three hours to fulfill this need, which just further shows the community support of and desire for this type of training. In closing, we would like to suggest that culturally responsive and anti-bias professional development be continuous throughout each school year. In our research, we found a statement from the Metropolitan Council of Educational Administrative Programs Committee on Cultural Responsiveness that states the following. We view educational leaders as going beyond having cultural proficiency knowledge and understanding. We believe that leaders must have the skills and capacities to create school conditions that remove barriers and achieve better equity and learning outcomes for all children. We draw on the Byrne, Jimenez, and Orr and their discussion of social justice leadership to frame this further. As they stated, one way to analyze this complexity is to explore how any definition addresses one of or all Four basic questions. Social justice for whom? Social justice by whom? Social justice how? And social justice for what? It is important to be aware of our place in this discussion. Without careful attention to doing with others instead of on others, we run risk of unintentionally replicating existing systems of oppression. Thank you so much for your time and we're open to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, do any of the panelists have questions um, about the presentation that Ms. Zielinski or Mrs. Sosa gave? Director um, Cruz, are you able to see the Q&A? Do you see that there's a question in there? Let me, Is, let me see. Ooh, I no, I cannot see that. <laughs> okay, well, I will be happy to read it. Um, it is from Vivian Williams. She asks, I was hoping for you to expand on why you relate equity to fairness. As in, I think maybe what is, it says, as that is what equality and equity, maybe what is the difference between quality, equality and equity? Um, yes, our so I'm sorry? Yeah. Yeah, Part of our could, equity yeah. committee discussion really revolves around the difference between equity and equality. Um, they do they do very much go hand in hand. I know Mr. McLeod and I had a we had a great conversation during the last equity meeting because there is there is a stark difference, but they are very similar. So while equity equality means fairness for all, of course, equity means that every students, that's what they need to be successful. It may not be the same thing, but they're all going to get exactly what they need to be successful, specific to each student's needs. I hope that answers your question. Um, Director Mrs. Cruz, that's the only one I saw, but I will keep my <laughs> eye on it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Mrs. Mead, will you um, continue with um, your presentation? Um, uh, the Ms. Mrs. Osik and Mr. Lindsay talked about professional development and service um, training, and I know that is within your purview. So, if you would, sure, um, I'm going to share my screen if that's okay. And let me just get back to my spot. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Give me one more second. I'm using a different computer today, so I'm a little off. Um, okay. I just wanna say thanks for having me. I think this is a great place to discuss everything. I'm really proud of this group and that was such an awesome presentation. So great job, ladies. Um, okay, so um, they asked me to be on this committee. I'm in charge of 
the AFT and SFT local site coordinator for um, our ERD courses. And our ERD courses run in the spring, in the summer, and the fall. I apologize for my computer being a little slow. And I think I'm waking up a bit, so I apologize. Um, my internet is not the best at times, so I apologize for the delay. Um, so um, one of the big pieces is providing professional development for our teachers through ERD. And um, that is the first thing I'm going to talk about. But before we start, I just wanted to say um, recently I was at a racial equity training, and this is what someone said to me. Um, the first rule of any racial equity training is leaning into your discomfort, because whenever we talk about race or anti-bias or anything like that, it causes a lot of people to be uncomfortable, but that's really okay, and everybody should lean into that. And um, a friend of mine, Jamal Easley, another Teach Plus um, advocate said that. So I just wanted to quote that. I think it's really important when we have these discussions to think about that. So ERD is a professional development program that is organized by the American Federation of Teachers and with the Scranton Federation of Teachers. And each course is worth three um, continuing profession education credits, so 90 hours, and we offer courses to all the teachers in the Scranton School District in the fall, spring, and summer. And this summer we're offering the courses to teachers outside of the Scranton School District if they'd like to take them. So um, in that, there are a couple courses um, that already deal with racial diversity and equity. So one of the courses um, that I teach along with Michelle Sickle is called Managing Antisocial Behavior. And there's six chapters to that course. And it basically teaches teachers how to discipline and how to get better behavior in the classroom. And one of the chapters is solely focused on implicit bias and race. Um, we need, um, it has the teachers take a quiz, a Harvard quiz about implicit bias and to recognize their own implicit, implicit bias, um, how each teacher may be biased in certain ways that they're not aware of. And it also has extensive instruction on the cradle to prison pipeline. So that course has been around for at least 15 years, if not longer. Um, and we currently have been teaching that all along. So um, when I started this position, we knew that we wanted to add more courses and we definitely wanted to add more courses with diversity. So the next course that we decided to start, which we'll be starting this summer, is called Strategies for Student Success. Um, in January of 2020, um, we contacted um, the American Federation Teachers National Organization and we asked to have two of our teachers nationally trained in SSS. And um, it usually costs about $3,000 per teacher to send to the training. And they agreed, since we are what's called a district in distress, um, they agreed to have us train for a, like a fraction of that cost, which was really great. So in July of 2020, we sent Andrea Gross, she teaches at Scranton High, and Courtney Homick, she teaches at South Intermediate, Immediate, to be trained virtually for 10 days. Um, they completed their training. And then what they had to do is write the course and present it to PDE and the NEIU. And through a rigorous um, approval process, we are almost done. We are at the very last phase. They just had to do a draft of one last page for the NEIU. And most likely, fingers crossed, it will be approved and offered in June. I can't see it not being approved. So in that course, um, again, it has another five chapters, five modules, or five units, as you would call them. There's a whole chapter on the influence of culture on learning, cultural responsive pedagogy and key considerations, framework for culturally responsive pedagogy, and culturally relevant pedagogy in action. So it really does spend a lot of time on teaching teachers how to teach with a cultural and diverse framework in their mind. So it, it's, I'm super excited for it to start this summer. Um, what does that mean for our teachers in Scranton? So what that means is they will now have access to two courses that include units on diversity and equity in the classroom. Um, the other section that um, Mrs. Cruz wanted me to talk further about is the in-service. And I believe that um, Bert has an in-service planned, I believe, for September that we're trying to bring through the in-service committee um, that 
Laura, Laura and Julie recommended. So that's the next thing that's on our phase. So we really are trying to in-service our teacher and bring things to light. And um, that's the first half of my presentation. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Odom and Mr. McLeod, uh, can you speak um, to why this type of professional development, ENRD courses, in-service um, learning for teachers is needed um, in the SSD in relation to your role as the Director of Youth Enrichment and as uh, a teacher at the intermediate level? If, if Mr. Odom, if you could begin. Sure. Um, first of all, um, you know, Laura, Julie, and Holly did a tremendous job of presenting information that is much needed to the district in order to see us grow. Um, but being an employee for the district for 20 years, I've seen our population change. Um, I've seen a greater need. Um, and I feel like, you know, the staff needs to grow, but I haven't seen much change in those areas. You know, whether we're providing a greater need, you know, for the kids or we have a staff that the kids see themselves in, you know. So for myself, it's been a challenge because so many kids come to me and, and, and they speak on, on, you know, on the fact of that, you know, teachers are not listening to them or not hearing them in which that they say, um, you know, they don't understand the environment that I come from. So why even try to have a conversation with them if, you know, right from the beginning, you know, I'm going to be shut down. And, and, and that's where I come in and try to bridge that gap between the two. But sometimes it's difficult because I just think that people don't understand, you know, the poverty issue that we're really dealing with. And sometimes I think that, you know, we try to not deal with it and try to say, okay, well, that kid is going to be okay. Well, that kid is not going to be okay. You know, and, and, I'm, and I'm concerned about these kids because it's an issue and the teachers don't know how to, to really look into it or, or how to deal with it themselves. Cause I don't know if they feel embarrassed about it or they feel like they don't need anything else on their plate. And, and, and it's a real struggle, you know? And, and, and every day I deal with these kids, you know, telling me, you know, like, how can I get this teacher to understand what I'm going through if they can't see it in my work? My work is a direct reflection of myself. If I'm feeling, I'm feeling for a reason, not because I want to, you know? so. I think that that has to be addressed. And like I said, this is, is a direct issue with a lot of kids who are in those impoverished communities. And I think that, that we, we can't see that. You know, if their basic needs are not being met, how can we help them move forward if their basic needs are not there? You know, these are a lot of latchkey kids who are living from couch to couch and place to place, you know? And, and I think that they, they wanna have a voice but they can't have a voice because they're not being seen. You know, that's 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 what I want to see. I want to see professional development in those areas where we at least have an opportunity to understand these kids. If we do that, I think that we can progressively move forward. If we get staffing in in order to help them, that they can reflect and you know see themselves, and I think that that'll be a that's helpful for them as well. But as of right now, they feel like there's no hope. You know. So, Mr. Odom, in your role as director of youth enrichment, are students recommended to you or do they come to you on their own? And, well, and what well, how they, come, they They either recommend it to me by uh, guidance, teachers, a lot of teachers, you know, refer a lot of kids to me. And then some kids just see me walking around in the hall and they come up to me and say, hey, you know, I'm having these issues. You know, principals, you know, refer kids to me. So I have a great relationship with every, you know, whether it's, you know, the principal, whether it's the guidance, whether it's the teachers, in which that, you know, the, you know so we resolve a lot of their issues, but, the, but again, I feel like, you know, it's, it's not the kid that sometimes is the issue, it's the adult that becomes the issue because they can't relate to these kids. And, and when you try to give a better understanding of it, I think that they, 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 get, a, they get a good understanding of it, but sometimes it, a lot of these kids fall between the crack because it's not enough people out there that have to, the education about it, the understanding of it, you know? So, you know, I think if you have, you know, a, a, a staff that is professionally, you know, educated or, 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 or they have a better understanding of it, I think that that would carry a long way where it's not one person doing it, it's a group of people that could be leading and helping. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Um, Mr. McLeod, do you have anything you contribute about why it's important? Okay. Um, may I share my screen, please? Yes, you may. Okay. You ready? Yes. <clears throat> I don't know if it's sharing yet or it's not sharing. No. Oh wait, wait a minute. Don't don't you have to make me the host? No, Robert. How this works. Robert, as a panelist, you can share. Excuse me? I said as a panelist, you can share your screen. Okay, uh, let me see here. Okay, sounds like Bill Del Preet speaking to me. Could be. <laughs> um, Mr. McLeod, as you're um, figuring yeah. that out, I have a, an answer, a comment here from um, from a few people. Okay. Um, Mrs. Hennehan saying, um, thank you. Maintenance and clerical employees often interact with students. And I do believe it is important for all employees to have a better interaction and understanding of what the students and other employees are going through. Sarah, that was in response. Um, she asked a question that I responded to. She wondered if the training would be available for all of the district employees. And I said, it is our goal to have anyone who interacts with students at, at any time during the day to have this training. Okay. That was part of a larger conversation. I didn't want you to be confused by just that little snippet yeah. there. Okay. okay, I believe I'm ready now. Okay. Mr. McClough, could you describe what we're seeing here? If you could give some context. Yeah, I, the video is less than a minute long. I just wanted to open up with that, just to kind of throw, um, I don't know, some uh, some emotions out there to see how people took it or take the video. Oh, Sorry. I'm not a, yeah. <laughs> let me get out of this. Okay, so on April 12th, 2018, two black men were handcuffed and arrested by Philadelphia police for sitting in a Rittenhouse Square Starbucks without purchasing something, sparking international outrage and a reckoning for one of the country's most visible brands. It was a moment seen around the world. After a video of the arrest of Rashawn Nelson and Dante Robinson went viral on Twitter, weeks of protests at the Starbucks location at 18th and Spruce Streets followed as did an apology tour by Starbucks leadership and nationwide racial bias training for the company's 175,000 employees. Racially sensitive professional development can lessen racial disparities in a school district and help close opportunity gaps as teachers better understand their own reactions towards students and the effect these biases have on them. This new understanding can cause them to re-examine the way they handle discipline in the classroom, for instance, and look better and look for better ways to handle situations that arise without resorting to referrals. It is vital for teachers and administrators to see how their own experiences may be 
unconsciously affecting their attitudes towards students. In order to be effective, experiences may be unconsciously affecting their attitude. I'm sorry. <laughs> In order to be effective, sensitivity training must be a part of a holistic, top-down culture that promotes diversity and inclusion. So I, I, I guess I should have premised this. I should have premised something before I started reading. I did a lot of research over the weekend, and um, I wanted to try something unique. I took a business model of diversity uh, somewhere from you know your typical corporate America uh, policy, and I've I've adapted that to a school district environment. I don't see why it can't be done because I believe it's a good fit. So I combine that with some of my personal experiences. There are three core ways to promote a culture. A, there are three core ways to promote a culture of racial inclusion. First, organizations must hire a diverse C-suite. I had to look that up. I didn't know what, I mean, that's a corporate term. So basically organizations with diverse decision makers at the executive level have a higher chance of being preemptive about these types of issues. In other words, getting out in front of the ball instead of being reactive, being proactive. Next, businesses must understand how their employees and customers feel. To get ahead of the curve, companies should include questions about racial bias on employee and customer engagement surveys. I don't believe we've ever done that in Scranton with the surveys. Finally, organizations must hold themselves accountable when it comes to tackling racial bias and consistently be making progress on it. I take that to be like self-policing. Let's not do something like what Starbucks did, which was to react to a, a nationwide backlash. I mean, it was just crazy. Let's get out in front of it. If we see something within our own ranks, I think we owe it to ourselves in the community to say something about it. Implicit bias. Companies often state that implicit biases can't be helped. I believe they can, not eliminated, but managed. Now, I'm going to share some uh, experiences with you about my implicit bias within the, skin, uh, within the Scranton School District. So when I was subbing about 11 years ago, I had two very interesting situations take place. One, well, actually they were both at an, they were both at elementary schools in the district. Uh, I'm not gonna, you know, mention their names. The first elementary school I visited, I went there early in the morning. Now, when I was a sub, it was very common for me to get to my workplace as early as possible so I can just take my time and, you know, go over the lesson plans. If there were any plans, if there weren't, I had to improvise just to get a feel for the classroom. So I knew where stuff was located, you know, just the basic, whatever. Um, I hear a knock on the door. Now, it's important for you to know how I was dressed. So I believe it was a Friday. I'm wearing a, a sweater, casual sweater dress slacks and dress shoes. I hear a knock at the door, I turn around and this, this lady was very polite, but it's a clear example of implicit bias, I believe. So her first comment was, and it was a question, um, who are you? And then she followed up with, may I help you? It might have been may I help you in the beginning. That it might have been may I, I can't exactly remember what it was, but it might have been may I help you. But may I help you means what are you doing here? That that's what that means. So it was awkward for me. It was awkward for her. I had a feeling that you know um, I needed to say something. So because I've been in situations like that before, and. Um, Typically, the outcome isn't a really positive one. <laughs> so I wanted to put her at ease by telling her who I am. I told her my name and I told her why I'm here. I'm a substitute teacher. Now, for her, 
to think otherwise. And this is the implicit, this is where the implicit bias comes in. Why, why was her first thought of me to not be a sub? Like she's never been, she's never seen me before. I've never been to that school. Why would her first thought be a negative one? We kept talking. She apologized to me because she thought I was maintenance. Now, I want to stop right there for a second. I don't mean any disrespect to maintenance people at all. A lot of my friends are maintenance workers. But how is that your conclusion? Like, why would you just automatically go that route? You know, like, like, no, nah, a black guy can't be a teacher. Not, not, not here. I've never seen you before. So there has to be a mistake. That, that right there is a clear cut case of implicit bias. Actually, it might be even borderline explicit bias, maybe mostly implicit, but maybe a little bit of explicit. I believe she meant well, but in the back of my head, I said, I knew I have to do I have to do a lot in this district. I have my work cut out for me. I would say about a month later, I went to another school, a month or two later. And um, actually, I think it was towards the end of the year because it was orals. That year, I only slept for a year. That summer, we, uh, the district had the orals. And it was about a month. It was, I don't know if any of you remember how hot that summer was. 11, I know I'm going back over a decade or about a decade, but about 10 or 11 years ago, we had a ridiculously hot summer. And I happened to be at an elementary school that didn't have any AC. Every classroom just had fans blowing hot air, which just made it worse. I went into this lady's classroom because um, it was during my lunchtime and um, she actually invited me in her room to have lunch with her. We were talking for a little bit and I told her about the upcoming orals and another case of implicit bias. This one, this time, I don't know if I got more upset than I did from the first lady at the other school, but it, it, it really, really bothered me. She told me to make sure I dress correctly at the interviews. She said, make sure you dress correctly. Don't be showing up, you know, wearing sneakers and, and jeans. Now, I have a master's degree. I had a master's since I was 24 years old. I'm one of the youngest employees to ever be hired in the Wilkes-Barre Area School District with a master's degree. I'm 48 now. So I had my master's for 24 years. So when this conversation happened between this lady and I, like I said, it was like 10, 11 years ago. So I was what, 38? For 14 years, I mean, I was working professionally. So for her to say that, she, this lady doesn't know really anything about my background. So yeah, I was insulted. Once again, why would you, why would you automatically assume that I don't know how to dress for a job interview? I've been on plenty of job interviews prior to coming to Scranton. It, it's almost like the benefit of the doubt was not presented to me in the beginning. Now, you ready for this? Getting back to the first lady, I want, you to all, I want all of you to think about this. Getting back to the first lady and the second lady. If they talk to me that way, imagine what they're saying to the kids. And I'm not trying to get anybody fired. I'm not trying to talk bad about anybody. But if they're talking to a grown man that way, a grown black man that way, who's an educated black man who has been teaching in the state of Pennsylvania for 20 years. This is my 20th year of teaching, 10 in Scranton, 10 in Wilkes-Barre. Imagine what they're coming across to the kids in terms of what they say, explicitly or, or implicitly. I have one more piece. Hope I don't sound long-winded. I just wanted to over, I, I tend to over-prepare for this and I rather had, you know, too much info than not enough. Training bias out of teachers. I actually saw this article towards the end of my research for this topic. And uh, it, it, it somewhat discouraged me, but I have a response for it. 
Training, there's actually an article with training bias out of teachers. Research shows little promise so far. That was taken from Education Week 11, 17, 20. I laughed at it because I believe you can train the bias out of teachers, not necessarily completely eliminating, but managing, managing. The fact of the matter is teachers have to buy into it. Now, these teachers who were surveyed, according to this research, if they were just pessimistic from the get-go, then, of course, the research is going to reflect that. You have to be open. You have to, you have to want better, not just for the kids, but for yourself. You can't, help, you can't help the kids if you can't fix you. This is an issue, and there's a, there's a former NFL player. I forgot his name. You might have seen him on TV. Yeah, he's actually the... Uh, the host for Chris Harrison on the uh, The Bachelor. He's going to finish the year. Forgot his name, but he came out with a book called A Difficult Conversation with a Black Man. Like I said, you might have heard it before. And um, I think it's about time for the SSD to have a to have a, a difficult conversation with this black man because we we have a lot of work to do. And I and like I said, I'm just I'm just impatient. I'm, in, I'm impatient. I've been here for 10 years. And like, it's like we're just going through the motions. We're doing stuff because the state's making us do it. I was honored to be, to be uh, recommended to be on the SSD's equity committee. But if I'm on that committee, just to fill, you know, just to fulfill a state mandate, just because it looks good, you can keep it. And I don't mean to be disrespectful. I'm tired. I'm tired of just like doing stuff because it looks good because of just, you know, paperwork that needs to be filed so we don't get sued. I'm sick of that. That's not who I am. I'm all about action. And I haven't seen action since I've been here for 10 years. I really want to help like rebuild, like restructure. Yeah, I said restructure, rebuild, because this, this district, it needs to be rebuilt, restructured to reflect a never ending minority population that's entering it. Scranton is not like 99% white, which is what it was when I first moved here. My dad took a trip. My dad took the family up to Scranton when we first moved here. Um, he, we all got scared because we haven't, we haven't seen black people in, you know, and I'm from New Jersey. I'm from Newark, New Jersey. If you know anything about Newark, uh, it's, it's most, I would say nowadays it's very, very racially diverse. But when I was younger, it was pretty much all black. Newark, Jersey city, New York, NYC metro area. Um, so it, it was, uh, it was a shock. It was a, it was a cultural and racial shock to us. And I'm sure it was to a lot of the white people who encountered us, who have never seen black people, let alone talk to black people for the first time. So, um, I mean, we can't, we can't solve this overnight. This is not an overnight solution. This is not having an in-service or a speaker once a year, which is what I'm used to. This needs to be like, we need to attack this aggressively, bring in somebody who we can hire part-time, who, who can actually be like an integral part of trainings. Like somebody we can see like at least on a monthly basis for like a year or two. I don't um, wanna, Missy? go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm pretty much done. I'm just kind of like rambling well, now. <laughs> I'm good now, I'm good. I appreciate the research that you've done and for sharing your own experiences, your lived experiences as a, as a teacher in the district. Um, Mrs. Mead, uh, Mrs. Sosek and Ms. Zelensky, do you believe listening to uh, Mr. Odom and Mr. McLeod's um, perspective, do you believe that the programs that you are trying to implement and that you presented tonight could help with what they, they're saying in terms of implicit bias? 
I, re I really think what Rob just said at the end that we need coaching and as an example for our professional development, I spoke on we had to get creative with our money because um, learning for justice was booked up. So we looked we outsourced to Jamila Pitts, who is a coach, and it would be just what Rob said, um, a perfect opportunity to have ongoing coaching for a group of teachers to when these discussions come up and concerns, um, we can bring them to her. And I think that would be extremely helpful. I think any type of training is needed. I think we have to start somewhere and we should start now. I think that it's been long overdue and I think it's time. Um, I, my heart goes out to Mr. McLeod and Mr. Odom. They are called repeatedly, repeatedly and repeatedly um, to help students almost to the point of overtaxing them with a burden. And that's not fair. All of us should be helping these students, not just two men. And I think we need to support them in their efforts and again, take some action. I think a survey is a great idea. I've never been surveyed on race by the Scranton School District. I think all of the trainings as um, Luann Hennahan suggested in the question and answers should be everybody, the clerks, the administrators, everyone should be trained in racial training, not just the teachers because all of us have interactions with students. So those are just some small things that I would include in the plan. Holly, thank you for addressing those questions. You, you summarized that beautifully. I was gonna make sure that Director Cruz saw them coming in the chat and I think that goes for the board as well. PSBA does have some great resources around these topics and that's absolutely something we wanna take on. Yes, yes, thank you, President Gilmartin. Um, so in addition to having increased professional development um, within the district. Another aspect of tonight's presentation is the need for um, teachers within the district who are representative of their students. Um, studies show that having teachers of color in the classroom help students, not only um, of diverse backgrounds, but also Caucasian students. Um, it impacts their performance. Um, it helps them with concentration, motivation, inspiration. And it also helps them to be exposed to new perspectives and to have an increased sense of civic engagement. So with that, Mrs. Mead, will you um, uh, mm -hmm. give the second part of your presentation tonight? Sure. So the second part of my presentation is a group that I work with called Teach Plus. Um, this group, can you guys see my screen? I'm assuming you can. Yeah. Um, Teach Plus is a teacher-led policy group. Um, there are 10 teachers statewide and we are trained in policy and advocacy. And one of the groups that I work with, the equitable funding side of everything, trying to ensure more funding for public schools in Pennsylvania, the, there's five of us that work on that. There's five other teachers that work on the recruitment and retention of teachers of color. And they're working with policymakers and institutions of higher education to develop teacher pipeline that increase the diversity of educator workforce in Pennsylvania. And they're suggesting and advocating policies um, to change this. So I just wanna say this isn't just a Scranton problem. This is a statewide problem, probably a nationwide problem. Um, and I'll show you why. So they Teach Plus is really, really trying to change policy within PDE and Harrisburg. Um, so I am going to minimize this and share the PDFs because they'd have been way too small if I tried to do them um, in this Google slideshow. So the first thing, oh, I'm sorry. The first thing I wanna talk about is what gets measured gets improved. So currently right now, um, we, there's students benefit from learning from diverse educators, but the problem is that teachers of color comprise 6% of our workforce, while students of color comprise only 36% of our student population, 50% of Pennsylvania's public schools, and 37% of school districts have no teachers of color at all. In 2013 and 14, the teacher workforce has become only marginally more diverse with the student body becoming more diverse, leaving thousands of students of color with no access to teachers who look like them. 
So one huge barrier in Pennsylvania is the lack of actionable data on the diversity of teachers in their workforce. Um, so if you look at this little pipe, um, this is kind of showing you the problem that um, school districts are not required to publish their race data for their workforce. They are required to publish it for their students, but not their employees. Um, and if you can't collect data, then you can't really make changes. So if you look at this pipeline um, in recent reports, um, the lack of diversity reporting is, an, is impendent to begin and has to be reported in order to adjust these shortcomings. So there were 33%, per, and this is only from filing right to nose, getting this data right here. It's not like people are freely giving out this data. They really have to dig to find it. So 33% um, of students um, of color were in K through public school enrollment. And then 27% became high school graduates. 21% were college bound graduates. 14.1 um, became teacher prep enrollees. 10.4 became teacher prep graduates. We don't know how many teacher prep graduates of color are passing teacher certification tests. We don't know how many um, teacher the teachers attempting to get their certification actually receive it of color. And we don't know how many first year teachers of color are hired. We don't know the retention rates and we don't know the current amount of teachers, which it does say 4%. But again, that's all based on data that's really only filed through right to nose. So Teach Plus is finding a solution. They're recommending the data points um, to be published. So the first phase would be racial, racial demographics of all enrolled candidates and program completers by program in all state teacher preparation programs annually. So we need to start reporting who is passing the teacher exams and candidates and who is not. Um, we also need to be able to see how many teachers of color are in each school district, each school, and at the state level as well. So we need some type of dashboard, which Massachusetts currently has. Um, the second thing is we need to see how many teachers take the teacher certification test and actually pass. We need to see how many teacher certifications are granted by race. We need to see how many new teacher applicants and hires are by race at each school district, school and state level, and the retention rates of teachers of color. So this is one big thing that Teach Plus is pushing for through PDE. Um, they've made these recommendations I don't think they've heard back from them yet, but that's one big push. The other big push they're recommending is for a culturally pro proficiency in Pennsylvania educators. So they feel that Pennsylvania educators need to be trained in cultural proficiency, which is what we've been talking about tonight, and there's a lack of it. Um, there's a growing body of research that reveals that teachers' implicit biases and lack of cultural competency contribute to these inequitable opportunities and outcomes. So evidence of implicit bias among preschool teachers has been connected to high rates of suspension and expulsion for young black students and schools with higher percentages of black students are more likely to use punitive disciplinary measures at higher rates. So we all kind of know the problem, but we don't have any solutions. So they're proposing that schools now um, have culturally responsive practices, that they create a positive school environment for students and through these culturally responsive practices initially, and eventually those will build better academic outcomes for students of color. Um, they will promote positive race relations. They will support retention of teachers of color. Um, teachers of color often feel devalued and isolated, and some may even leave the profession as a result of the pressures. Um, the PDE right now, um, they also recommend the Roadmap to Equity. Um, that's Virginia's uh, Department of Education. It's very good. Um, they also recommend that PDE revises its equity toolkit. It's a little outdated. And they also uh, suggest um, modeling it after the equity toolkit for administrators in Colorado. Um, they need to require a cultural profici proficiency pre-service and in-service training by all teachers by 2023, making it a law that they have to be trained, such as similar suicide suicide trainings, et cetera. And they would like to integrate the cultural proficiency into state teacher licensure, licensure requirements, meaning that um, students currently at universities would be trained. Um, so that's some of the initiatives that they are going over. 
And let me just continue. I'm sorry, that was kind of long-winded, but those are pretty important initiatives, I think. And I'm really proud of the work that my five colleagues have done and they created those one pagers and have, prevent, have presented to PDE so far. So they are really, really trying and I'm proud of them. Um, the second thing I want you to know is that um, Teach Plus is also, um, they have a social media campaign and this is more individualized. Um, so they started a group called Choose to Teach in PA. We need to plant the seeds to grow teachers of tomorrow. You can use that QR code to write a student of color and inspire them to pursue teaching. You can also use another QR code to choose a student of color that you think should be a teacher. And you can recommend that they receive a letter from another teacher of color inspiring them. Um, they thought that so many students don't even see it as a potential job opportunity for themselves because they don't see many um, teachers of color in their districts. So they wanted to provide that opportunity. So that is all on social media. If you go to Teach Plus um, PA, you will find other campaigns. This one's more about funding. Um, we realize that equitable funding is also related to equitable education, especially for students of color. So that's another big piece. So they, um, if you have any questions, you can email me here. I would highly recommend following them on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram if you um, want any more information, but I'm really proud of what my colleagues have done. Um, they they're just excellent and um, I wish I should I wish I could have someone here to speak for of them I can probably invite them back if you want one of them to speak but that's the work that they are doing um thank you mrs Mead so er, um, earlier you said that mr McLeod and mr Odom that a lot of times they're brought in or they're normally the go-to person whenever a student has an issue um, or, or is in a situation. So, so gentlemen, how would having a more diverse teaching population, not just, not just in the classroom, but also um, at all levels within the district, help, help you al alleviate some of that burden on you professionally and personally, but also to um, a large swath of the student body in terms of having that connection with somebody who uh, frankly looks like you? Um, to, to, to inspire you, to help you as, as a student? Well, coming, coming from the Bronx, New York, and being born and raised in the Bronx and going to school there all my life, I didn't have many Black teachers as well growing up there. The thing about it is I had teachers who were educated about the situation that we were in, you mm -hmm. know? So the... the the better educated they were about us and the community that they were in, the better that they were to serve us. And I think that that's what it was about for me. You know, I had Jewish teachers, I had, you know, Andy, I had every, I had any kind of teacher that was there, but I know that they were there to serve us and to help us, right? So last year, I, I probably had four friends that moved here from New York that were educators. And I tried to get them coaching positions in the district and, the district didn't hire them for some reason. You know, now one is a coach at up in Pocono Mountain, you know, in which that there's a, hard, a, a huge diverse population up there that they work in, didn't hire them here. Master's degree, education, play professional basketball across season. I couldn't understand why the district didn't hire him. Another one of my friends, same thing. TSS worker, work with kids, uh, play, play that LaSalle, um, play the cross seas, the district didn't hire him and it was a co coaching position that was open. And then I had, um, at the time, like 10 years ago, Tammy Waiters, who was a student of the Scranton School District, helped get into the University of Scranton, applied for a position for, for the Scranton School District, didn't get a job there, you know? And then I have, you know, Tiffany Williams, you know, who's, who's around and she wanted the position and the same thing happened. So my thing is, I'm, I'm bringing them, you know, I'm, I'm attracting them to the district. We have to do a better job of, I don't know what the rating system is. I don't know how they're supposed to get in, but I thought a foot through the door, especially with the kids that I deal with, was through sports. Because I run two programs. I run a, a program called Bound for Betterment. Bound for Betterment is which that I utilize um, University of Scranton educational students, and they, and they come in and tutor kids. And they tutor the kids 
And then after they do that, we'll go and to the gym, we'll play basketball. And so if the academics are good, then I felt like then they, we could participate in athletics. Um, I also run a program that's called Ball Beyond Athletics Life Lessons. I bring coaches in, like the two guys that I told, told you about and a couple of my friends who are college educated to come in and talk to these kids about where, where are they going? What are they prepared for? You know, I help kids get IDs, license, jobs, anything to help them continue to move forward and progress in life. But we also tell them that basketball is just a tool in order to get to them where they need to be. So I use, I utilize a lot of my girls who play on my teams to tutor these kids as well. So we're bridging gaps just by, you know, having kids that they wouldn't really interact with being able to, to communicate with. And I feel like that is big. So, so for me, it's, I think it's important to get people who look like you, but it's also to educate the ones who are here that, that these kids can learn from, you know, cause it, it's, we don't know if we could get teachers here. It's, hard, it's a hard sell for the district. You know, like what is going to attract the person to come here? We don't have the best pay. It's, it's you know, the district is struggling. We, they have so many other obstacles they have to take care of. Let's tackle the ones that are in front of us right now to make sure that we at least have the people who are here care enough in order to serve them. Right, mm -hmm. it'll boost morale for everyone. It can be able, you know, kids be like, oh, I can trust Mrs. or Mrs. So and so. I think that that is important because I think that, you know, we need to do better. We have to do better, you know. Or what are you gonna do to do better, you know? But I think that, you know, what Luann said, I, Luann sees me all the time, and I work with Luann all the time, and and she sees me there late at night, leaving, cleaning the gym, doing anything I can, teaching these kids a sense of responsibility. If they we utilizing the facilities, let's clean up the facilities so they can always know that we're taking care of the facilities. So I do all of these things to try to give us a better opportunity to help these kids. But when it comes around to hiring some people who look like them, we don't do it, and that hurts. It just hurts because I don't know what else I can do, you know? And I think that it's important for us to just be better, do better, see better, want better. You know, I, I mm -hmm. think that that's important. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Odom, um, uh, a parent, Brandy Solomon has asked a question. How would a parent go about um, getting their child into your tutoring program? Um, usually if they just, like we would attend from like seven, like I come in the gym like at six o'clock at night. And then, so the tutors would be there. So if not, if they needed to have help, I would, you know, I was reaching out to Pat Carroll that is at the University of Scranton who was in charge of the tutoring program. And that's how they were getting, that's how I was getting tutors involved with them. So the University of Scranton is extremely open to helping kids um, because, you know, to help kids with tutoring. So I think mm -hmm. that they would have to just contact, you know, as of right now, because of what's going on with the pandemic, I don't know how are they, they they're not coming out to the schools, of course, but mm -hmm. when, when the schools were open, they were willing to send tutors over in order to help out. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Kester Vinci, as a director of human resources, um, Mr. Odom just said that you know, there, there have been challenges previously to attracting um, applicants of color to the district. Could you speak about how, what the, uh, the district could do in terms of your office to, to better attract um, applicants of, of color in terms of reaching out, social media? Sure, thank you and, and uh, good evening everyone. Yes, um, Last, at the last board meeting, the school board approved um, a contract with Frontline, um, which is a company that has a uh, application tool that we are very excited about. And we've already started meeting with the company on the implementation phase. Our hope is that we get this um, application and recruiting tool uh, in place for our big summer hiring. So our goal is the, by the end of April, because we're already seeing school districts um, posting for anticipated openings for next school year. This is the earliest in my 30 year career that I've seen um, districts actually post for the coming school year, but that just shows you um, how difficult it is for all districts to find candidates. Um, so this, this tool I think is, is great because right now the district in the past has mostly relied on its website to post positions. Um, now with this new um, recruiting and hiring tool, we will be able to, with, with a push of the button, push our jobs out 
on Facebook, on Twitter, um, which hopefully will get more eyes on them and uh, re, you know, actively recruit more people and, and hopefully a more diverse applicant pool to the school district. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm very excited about the, the uh, prospects of that. Um, I did also wanna piggyback on um, something somebody said earlier. I really think we have to look locally um, the district has had a strong practice of hiring, you know, local, you know, former district grads and things of that nature. I think, you know, that's something, you know, if, if we can get our youth excited about pursuing education as a career, um, you know, that would be wonderful. And, um, you know, our, our state system of higher education has great programs. Our community colleges are great ways uh, for kids to start. Um, for two years and then move on to that next step. Um, you, know, uh, you know, we're going to need a lot of candidates in the future as we have, we see retirees and things of that nature. Um, we're losing people to other districts. So we're gonna have a need to fill positions. Um, so I, I would say Scranton is, is hiring at this point. Awesome. Yeah, and I think you make a really good point. Um, and I know that that we um, as a district and us as individuals have various relationships with um, the University of Scranton, Marywood University, Lackawanna College, Keystone College. Um, and so I think it's really good that we pull from from the resources that we have locally, um, students within our, within our district who, who may be attending those universities um, and going into a the education, the education field. Yep. Um, is there any other anybody else who would like to contribute either a question or a comment um, in terms of either the professional development side or the um, attracting teachers of color side? Any Director Cruz, like? I just wanted to make one final comment. We, we yeah, sure. you know, obviously for good reason talk a lot about the need for professional development and that ties right into the Charlotte Danielson teacher evaluation model, um, especially a domain to the classroom environment, developing a classroom environment of respect and rapport and creating a culture for learning. Um, so it ties right in, that, that type of training ties right into just um, what we are expected to do professionally. So. Thank you so much for pointing out. What was the name of that, of that core you said? The Charlotte Danielson Teacher Evaluation mm -hmm. Model. It's pretty much the, the Pennsylvania Department of Education approved evaluation system that that we follow okay thank you mr castro vinci it's it's interesting that you said that because i was having a conversation with someone in the q a um who asked how we would measure success once we implement this professional development and i i gave that exact answer that i feel like it would be reflected in teacher evaluations including classroom climate and um class um, learning establishments, uh, learning outcomes and things like that. So I think that's right on with how we would measure the success of this professional development. Agreed. Sarah, uh, I would like to touch on a comment that John made a few minutes ago regarding mm -hmm. Scranton is hiring. Here, here's, here's one of the big issues with bringing teachers of color to Scranton. One of the big issues with attracting racial minority teachers has to do with money. I can't tell you the number of times I've had people say to me, male and female, there's just, there's just not enough money, you know? So most of my black, Latino, Indian, Asian friends, I mean, they've gone into finance and corporate America. That's, that's the trend. It's been like that for years. If you do your research, back during, and this is odd, back during the 70s, I would say from the 60s to the 80s, probably, you had, you had the biggest influx of teachers of color in, in U.S. schools, especially during the 70s. I think it even peaked between the 70s and the 80s, it peaked. How in the world did, did that peak? That was so long ago. We're in trouble. I mean, we can still pull this off, but we, we got to get the claws out and just work harder. The fact that teachers of color being 
being attracted to school districts actually applying for jobs and not just applying for jobs. The other issue is retaining those teachers. Teachers of color, for some reason, are really hard to retain in contrast to the other races due to high burnout. Me personally, I don't think I put this on my resume because it was a terrible experience, but I went down to Washington, D.C. prior to, you know, between Wilkes-Barre and Scranton, went down to Washington, D.C. Let me tell you, I never thought I would miss Northeast PA as much as I did before I moved back. I miss, I actually missed like the traffic on 495, if, for those of you who are familiar with DC, traffic, crime, cost of living. I actually missed being stuck on 81 for hours. Unlike, you know, unlike the old me when I used to complain about it. It is a different world down there. It is a different world. I'm talking about predominantly black schools, like 98%. I was in a 98% black school, not actually in DC, literally like a few blocks up in Maryland called Prince George's County. That's the name of the county right outside of Washington. 99.9, .9, point whatever black. Half the teachers were non-black. So this is an issue in predominantly black schools as well. I only lasted several months down there. I got burned out. When I applied for a job, they pretty much stuck me in the quote unquote, almost lifted up my right shoulder. That would have been a no-no for those of you who know what I'm talking about. Quote unquote, high needs. They stuck me in a high needs school. For the veteran educators, I think we know what high, high needs means. They stuck me there. They knew exactly what they were doing. I had no idea what I got myself into. I underestimated the environment and I didn't last. And I know I'm a good teacher. And in, and in an experience like that, it made me second guess my, myself as a good teacher. I actually like second guess myself. Maybe I'm not as good as I thought I was. I, you know, I was, I was the man back in Wilkes-Barre, back in Northeast PA. I come down here, I'm like dirt, you know, just struggling. So those are other issues that we face with attracting racial minority teachers. High burnout, um, not enough money. Getting to John's point, we're on a salary freeze. This is what, year four, year five? I can't keep count. I, I don't want to attract teachers of color to this district until we get this freeze done and over with. We have to end the freeze. We can go ahead and do the work. So when it's time to hire, there's less work to do. But how do we attract teachers of color? What's the selling point? Come to Scranton, we got a salary freeze. I think I wanna piggyback on what uh, Mr. McLeod is saying is that a new teacher and Teach Plus is focused on this as well. A new teacher of color coming out of a university or college has a ton of student debt. So that's a big piece for a new teacher to be attracted to a district. They're going to be going to the district that pays them the most. They're not gonna be going to a district that pays them the least. So for us to attract teachers of color, we have to have a higher starting salary for those teachers. Um, they're not gonna come because they're not gonna be able to pay their student loans. Think back to when you were 22 or 23, that's what you were focused on. That's who we're looking for and it's really hard to get them. So I think that's another big piece to this puzzle that needs to be solved. And I know there's loan forgiveness out there through uh, the federal government, but I think that that, that won't be enough. Not, not to bring in the percentage and remember, like, we're not going to hire everyone we interview. So if we don't get a large pool of teachers of color applicants, just think about that. If, if our pool is small because of the fact that we're on a salary freeze for the fifth year and all this other stuff that we've discussed, the number of people we actually hire is going to be a fraction of that. My goal, like... Whether or not I stay in Scranton, I would love for, well, we have 17, 18 buildings. I would love for there to be a teacher of color. And I don't mean just black. I mean, just non-white. 
and I love white people. <laughs> I don't want you to think I, I know I don't want to come across as like I just don't like not you know I just don't like white people at all. But I, I'm I'm all about schools reflecting the communities they serve. I'm big on that, especially in terms of positions of authority and leadership. A lot of our kids of color outside of the home, they constantly have white people telling them what to do. I want all of you to think about that for a minute. And we wonder why they have a lot of the issues they have with police. Constantly being bombarded with white people in positions of authority or leadership telling them what to do. Not only that, but writing them up, writing discipline referrals. So these kids, a lot of them, they, they harbor that. They harbor those emotions and they carry that stuff with them. That will affect what kind of, you know, that will affect their family life as they get older, what kind of jobs they get, going to college. All that stuff is connected. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm done for now. <laughs> for, for, for. Um, I, think you, I think you make a really interesting point about, um, actually, could you repeat what you said about le- like leadership positions, people in leadership positions? Um, no not just in the yeah, I mean, outside of the home or let's go back to the home. Let's, you know, let's go back to the home. In terms of, in terms of authoritative and leadership positions, you have mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, who's ever taking care of the kids, uncle outside of that home in Scranton, Pennsylvania. I, I don't see how, I don't see how, because we're the next line of defense in terms of giving these kids opportunities and chances to be successful, to feed them. I mean, we're serving breakfast, lunch. I mean, eventually dinner, I guess. But I can't think of anyone else in, in leadership positions, authoritative positions, besides school staff. And when you have, what, only one-tenth, one one half of a percent of your teaching faculty being teachers of color. I did the math. It's one tenth. It's not even a full percent. It's, I keep on saying one tenth. It's one half of a percent. It's decimal point zero five, zero five, whatever. So there's me, another black woman and a multiracial person, multiracial man with 591 white teachers. There has to be, there has to be people of leadership, of authoritative, people of leadership who have an authoritative role some way, somehow in these kids' lives where these kids can immediately connect with them. And for a lot of kids, especially the elementary kids, it's skin color. It is what it is. I had an argument with a coworker of mine couple years ago, he flat out told me he doesn't understand how I could be like, why am I a better role model for black kids, especially black males than he would be? And he took it the wrong way. So I tried to, I tried to get him to understand. I tried to get him to put himself in the mindset of a black kid, of a young black male walking into a classroom, never having a black teacher before. Now he does. It's a feeling that I can't, I can't describe. I can't describe. I never had any black teachers until I went to college. My first black teacher, if you will, I know college professors hate being called teachers, but they are teachers. Whether they like it or not, they're teachers. So um, I would have loved to have a Mr. McLeod when I was a kid because I, I know I go well well above and and beyond my call of duty to do what I can for all kids. White kids need to see, I know I'm kind of skipping around, white kids need to see people like me. I consider myself a stereotype buster for a lot of these white kids. I mean, it's nice to know that I became successful without having to throw a football, although I play football without having to shoot a basketball, without having to have a microphone in my hand, walking on the stage with my pants hanging halfway 
down my legs. It's I'm proud. I'm, I'm proud of the fact that, and no disrespect to entertainers and professional athletes, but we're all, that's not, that's not everyone with dark skin. You know, we, we, we are intelligent. We are academic. But when the kids, and I say all kids when I say this, but when kids, they can hear all that they want. You know, you could be president, this, that, and the other. They got to see it. It's not enough for them to hear it, especially if it's only white people saying, yeah, you could be anything you want, Reggie, Tyrone, whatever. But if Tyrone, Reggie, you know, Lucinda, you know, Violet, whatever, if they're not seeing it, It's not going to happen. They got to see it. Kids, kids are a lot more, kids are a lot more, um, oh, is it conceptual? What's the, I'm trying to look for the word. Um, Hands-on, visual. I think kids are more visual learners than older kids. Older kids tend to be more abstract with their thinking, but with kids, the little ones, you know, they identify pretty much at the surface value. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I don't I want to bring black teachers or, or any kind of teachers of color to Scranton just just to have them here. Mm -hmm. they, they need to be more than qualified, of course. Yeah. But I, I, I believe we, we would definitely be taking a huge step in the right direction if we just had some representation. I know I, I cut myself off a while ago with the schools. We have 17, 18 schools in Scranton. I would love for there to be at least one person in each of those schools. It would still be a disservice. It would still be a low representation, but to have one in every building, elementary all the way through, I mean, well, shucks, pre-K all the way through high school. That would be awesome. Every kid in that building will be able to say, I have a teacher of color who is not necessarily my teacher, but who teaches, who teaches in the same building where I attend the school, you know? So um, I would love um, that to happen. Um, to wrap up tonight's um, event, is there anybody else um, um, on, on the panel who would like to contribute um, some perspective on this? Um, Falls in, Ms. Cruz, is that? Okay. Oh. Yeah. as a safe haven for a lot of kids of color and we know mm -hmm. that you know some kids don't come from the same environment you know like i grew up with no parents man you know i paid for school myself i got through school with no help you know i was school is the place where teachers educated me how to be a better person understand the importance of what education is about right it's about betterment you know mm -hmm. They gave me clothes, they fed me. And school is that place where kids should be feeling, should feel safe at, because I didn't feel safe at home, but I felt safe at school. And the teachers helped me get there, you know? Nobody in my household told me the importance of education. Educators told, taught me the importance of what education is. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, I had a sixth grade teacher named Miss Hazel who taught me about African-American studies that made that that, that gave me a sense of importance. So it's important to have that teacher that is of color that's going to get you there and the relatability that we can we can be able to chop it up and be like, hey, you know what, this and this and, and re be able to relate. But it's also an opportunity for, for teachers who, who may not have that understanding to get it, you know, to see what these kids are struggling. People, kids, teachers didn't know that I was being abused emotionally, physically, sexually. I was being abused in every way possible. You know, and I never was able to share that or tell anybody because I understood the consequences when I went back home that I could be taken away from my mother, regardless to how bad she was. She was still my mother and I still felt safe. But if I had somebody to talk to, I felt like maybe I wouldn't have struggled as much as I struggled, you know, and mm. I feel like if we can just understand what what some of these kids that we deal with struggle with, and I'm talking about, it's not just the black and white kid, it's the impoverished kid as well. You know, we got to think about when you poor, man, all poor people deal with the sim similar issues. And we want to make sure that we address all of the issues that are at hand. You know, I'm here to speak up for the, 
for the for the for the minority kid, the brown kid, but I'm also here to pe- speak up for the impoverished kids because I deal with a lot of those kids too. And just because we don't look like each other, we relate on the abuse level and of so many other ways that they're hungry. You know, like we relate on so many other levels. We, we got to be able to relate. If we can't relate, then we can't teach. And we got to mm-hmm. be able to do a better job of recognize those things so we can make our classrooms a little bit better, make our classrooms mm-hmm. and our schools a little bit safer. If we can't do that, that's a shortcoming to ourselves and as a district, we got to do better. We got to be better. Have to. Right. You know? So that's Thank why. Thank you, I- Mr. Odom. Thank you. Is there uh, anyone else? I was thinking as a, as a board member, what a panel discussion like this would be like without the perspectives of Mr. Odom and Mr. McLeod. And I can't. Uh, your perspectives are essential. So I really want to thank you for your willingness to share. Um, and uh, I know we're getting to the end of this. So I just wanted to point out Mina Artistani in the uh, Q&A uh, brought up a good point about we're not just talking about teachers of color, we're also talking about a need for administrators of color. Uh, I think that's important. And uh, Mr. Castrovinci, just uh, looks like uh, Ms. Hamilton Fay has a question for you there if you wanted to address it. And also uh, Director Dempsey has an interesting uh, comment about the, uh, uh, the uh, initiative of trying to get uh, 21,000 black students into the teacher pipeline over the next 12 years, which is, which is fascinating stuff and very important as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> finish. Um, so I just wanna um, thank my, my colleagues on the board for, for um, supporting me um, tonight, as well as Superintendent McTiernan and her team for their support as well, and for welcoming um, this discussion. Um, like I said in my introduction, this will not be a one and done presentation. We will be having more in the future. Um, and we welcome any feedback from the SSD community, from the greater community, those watching tonight, those um, who will be watching in the future. This is being recorded. I know it'll be probably posted on the district website um, on our YouTube channel. Um, so once again, thank you for joining us. And I uh, thank um, the panelists, Mrs. Mead, Mrs. Sosick, Ms. Zelensky, uh, Mr. Odom, and Mr. McLeod. So thank you so much. I really, I really appreciate this. Thank you. Director Cruz, thank you for organizing this this evening. And thank you, uh, as she said to all the panelists, this was a really valuable discussion. And I think we've got a lot of work ahead of us and we'll get it done. I just want to make sure that everyone is clear that our next meeting is at a different Zoom link. If you do not have it, it is of course available on the district website. So just be sure to leave this session and join us for our next meeting in just a few moments. Thank you again, Sarah.